safe, it should be legal, and it should be rare. Union solidarity forever. Change is coming by disaster, or change is coming by design. If you're not moved, you'll be subject to arrest. This is your third and final warning. Civil disobedience has to become the new normal. Everybody. Well, of course, they saved the best for last. What can we say? Um, Jane, first of all, thanks so much for coming to the Ideas Festival. Oh my God, I'm honored to be here. I've only known Aspen for skiing. This is a whole new world, and I'm so honored to have been asked. Thank you, darling Tina. I'm so happy to be included. Well, hopefully you'll come back. But um, we have a lot to talk about. But before we dive into your current passion, uh, climate change, you are positively indefatigable. You have so much energy, woman, and inquiring minds want to know, <laughs> where does it well, come from? How do you do it? Well, I don't know. I take good care of myself. I, I eat well. I exercise. I sleep. I'm ashamed to say I sleep on average nine hours a night. But, no, that's uh, good. <laughs> truth be told, every neuron in my body is energized to confront the climate crisis. I feel like this is what I was born to do, to use my platform in whatever way I can to confront the climate crisis. And so energy is what I'm, yeah, I mean, energy is what we're going to talk about. And let, let's, let's talk about your work, because I think, first of all, you've been an activist your entire adult life, Jane. And I'm curious, did you have an epiphany or an aha moment that made you say, this has got to be my focus for the rest of my life? Uh, where to begin? Well, I was born in 1937. We don't have to go far, that far well, back. Well, let me just, <laughs> <laughs> I was born in, I spent the first 10 years of my life in California. There were no freeways, there was no smog. There were only 2 billion people in the world. I could swim safely in the ocean. It wasn't poisoned. Um, I, I was a tomboy, and so I was one with nature. I love nature. I love birds. I would go to sleep to the cry of coyotes. And then I left. And I didn't really come back to live in California, in Los Angeles, until I was in my 40s. I had two children. I remember when I first moved back, my eyes burned. My children developed asthma. I couldn't understand why everybody wasn't talking about this, but I realized it was because they'd gotten used to it. And that scared me. We lived near the ocean and near one of those runoffs that brings the wetness from the city down God forbid, into the ocean, and the lifeguards were getting cancer. And um, when I was little, cancer was very rare. Nobody knew anybody that had cancer. And when we found out somebody had cancer, it would be whispered, and we'd call it the big C. They've got C. And suddenly, in the 70s and 80s, I began to realize there was a cancer epidemic. And everybody either knew somebody that had cancer or had cancer or... <clears throat> but to be honest, I was looking at what was happening around me on the ground and I was concerned and I would march whenever there was a march or a protest. But it wasn't until five and a half years ago with the encouragement of a book by Naomi Klein called On Fire and reading about Greta Thunberg that I began to actually pay attention to the science. I, I'm ashamed to say that. And when I read the science, the reports, the IPCC reports, it was like a lightning bolt hit me. I realized the homework is right there. They're telling us with a clarion call what we have to do and how much time we have. And, you know, I come from a long line of really depressed people. <laughs> and I was going down a rabbit hole. There was one day about five years ago in LA, the sky was orange brown because of the wildlife. Birds I read were falling out of the sky over Arizona and New Mexico. And I started to go down a rabbit hole of depression. And then I decided, fuck it, 
And I called Annie Leonard, who at the time was running Greenpeace, because they're the bravest of the big green organizations. And I said, I'm gonna, I want to move to DC and raise a ruckus. And first, I wanted to camp out. I was worried about where to poop because I've pooped a lot in wilderness. I don't know how, to, what do you do in cities? I didn't know what to do. And she said, it doesn't matter because you can't, it's illegal now. You can't, you can't camp, uh, not poop, but you can't camp out in Washington. <laughs> so I went to Washington and, and for a bunch of months, um, left my comfort zone, which is what Greta Thunberg said to do. And the goal was not government. The goal was we knew because of research that over 70% of Americans were concerned about climate. About 30% of them, when asked, said that they would engage in civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience. And when asked why they didn't, they said, well, nobody asked me. So our target was the great unasked. And I was, I turned 82 in jail during that time. And I knew that it would, it would wake some people up. Well, God, if she can do it, I can do it. And whip, hundreds of people would come from all over the country. Some came from Europe, mostly women, mostly with gray hair. And uh, it made a difference. And then when COVID hit, we continued um, online and we had 9 million in 2020 and 10, 10 million in 2021. It made a difference. We trained them to be activists. Um, but here's the problem, you see, we, we, we weren't getting the policies that we needed that were commensurate with what science says we have to have. No new drilling, fracking, cut our emissions in half and gradually, not a sudden turn of the spigot, but gradually begin to phase out of fossil fuels so that by mid-century we'd be off fossil fuels. That was the homework. That's and right. that's what I've been focused on. And, and according to a UN report, we have a chance to prevent the worst effects of climate change Hopefully. if we quickly reduce carbon pollution and fossil fuel use by almost two thirds by 2035. So Jane, what happens if we don't meet that deadline? Well, we can still, if, we can still reduce the heat. Every half degree of heating that we can prevent will save hundreds of millions of lives. So we have to continue to fight to reduce the warming, to reduce our emissions. But we have to try to make it happen quickly and we can do it. That's the good thing is the scientist says, it's not too late, but it's gonna require a whole lot of people being very, very brave very, very quickly. And we can do that, right? <laughs> right. You know, I, I think I've done a lot of research in preparation for this interview, and I thought it was sad that less than 5% of adults see climate change as the single most important issue when it came to voting. Why is it so low? In I'm not view? sure that's true. I read yesterday that 63% of Americans think that climate is a very important thing to vote for. I know that people between the ages of 18 and 39, young people, um, in fact, I have some statistics here that I can share with everybody, that a recent NPR PBS poll found that nearly 60% of those between the ages of 18 and 29 yeah. believe climate change should be a priority, but less than 5% of adults rank climate change as the single most important issue. So we've got some work to do. How do we convince more people that this is such a, an important issue and they need to think about it when they're voting? I beg all of you, when you vote, vote with climate in your heart. This election in November is an existential election. What happens is going to determine a lot about what kind of future we leave our children. You know, I mean, we can leave our children inheritance. Isn't it better to leave them a planet? I think. Let's, let's talk about the candidates, because I know that uh, according to the New York Times, NPR, and the Wall Street Journal, and as well as a number of other sources, President Biden has done more to address climate change than any other president. This isn't framing, these are facts, everyone. Among his accomplishments, his administration has passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is considered landmark legislation, includes $369 billion in energy security and climate change programs over the next 10 years. 
He's also finalized more than 100 new environmental regulations aimed at cutting air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, restricting toxic chemicals, and conserving public lands and waters. Having said that, what do you wish, what do you wish President Biden had done that he hasn't done? Well, he's tried. The, one of the most important things that he needs to do is to cut subsidies. We taxpayers give $20 billion every year to the industry that is killing our planet and us. That is unconscionable. And we have to stop. And if we do cut the $20 billion that we give to the fossil fuel industry, it will make a huge difference. President Biden has tried to do it. It's the filibuster issue. But one of the things that we have to ask President Biden to do is to put a much more pressure to really champion this issue. And we have to then elect people to Congress and the Senate who will listen. You know, the, the fossil fuel industry gives hundreds of millions of dollars to our elected officials, just as many Democrats as Republicans. They have a stranglehold on our government. One of the reasons that I recently, start, three years ago, started the Jane Fonda Climate Pact, we elect people down ballot because that's where the robust work is, is, is happening. And when I say down ballot, I mean mayors, city councils, state legislatures, supervisors. These are the people that can really make a difference. And it's been stopped a lot because they're in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry. I was here earlier this year in Denver raising money for my PAC, and we visited Commerce City. I don't know how it, many of you have been to Commerce City. It's a community right next to, to Denver where the mortality is 25% higher than the rest of the country, where the air is poisoned. They've got Suncor, they've got Purina, and they have waste management. They are dying and they're not getting any help from the Colorado state legislature or governor. Nobody's listening to them. This is why we have to elect people at the county level, the local level, the state level, who will pay attention, who are not governing for corporations, but governing for people and people's health and children's health. Do you know that 93% of the children in the world breathe air that is so poisonous that it endangers their health and their development? 93%, one out of every five people that die in the world die because of fossil fuel related air pollution. It is, there's a climate crisis and right alongside is a robust health crisis. You know, the, the poisoned air doesn't know when they get to the street where Commerce City ends and then wealthy people live. We're all eventually going to be breathing poisoned air, drinking poisoned water. We can't escape it. So in we're fact, all in this together. I, I don't care what party you belong to. We all have to join in this November to save the planet. And then when, when that happens, then we can get together and figure everything out <laughs> with all our differences. But for the sake of your children and the planet, Vote with climate in your heart in November. And Jane, just to add, add to some of those figures, seven million people die every year from air pollution alone, not to mention the ha an estimated half million people who die from extreme heat, and clearly that number's increasing. Wildfires kill more than 300,000 people annually and thousands in floods worldwide. So I know that the health ramifications of climate change that's one of the things that yeah. really drew you to this issue. Uh, well, I got cancer. I was hoping my hair would fall out because oh, that's right. there'd be all this territory. I could tattoo climate emergency, <laughs> you know? And, and I, I hired someone to actually do it. And then I, Annie Leonard introduced me to a, to a climate activist who's, who said, no, 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 because the cancer community isn't gonna like that joining together with climate. And this the hair didn't fall out anyway. It got curly. I mean, it's almost worth it to have, for me to have. <laughs> Looks curly. great. But I found out, I started doing research and found out the relationship between cancer and what's ha what we're burning fossil fuels that's, that's poisoning the air and the chemicals. It's not just, it's not just fossil fuels. I was recent, I spent three weeks in January making a documentary called Gaslit a good title, about what's happening in the Gulf states of Texas and Louisiana. Most people don't know this, but those states on the Gulf Coast, 
is the number one climate bomb in the world. What that means is that the terminals that are already there and the ones that are going to be built, if they continue, will release one gigaton of carbon dioxide and methane. That's what it's going to do to all of us and to our planet. We are the number one exporter of gas and oil in the world. The United States is. It's, they justify it by saying it's, it's because of the war. The terminals started to be built before the war, and the war, please God, will end before the terminals are finished. Dozens of terminals are already functioning, and dozens more are waiting to be permitted. The, the terminals to receive our exported gas are all over the world. Thousands waiting to be permitted in Japan, all over the world. This, is, this will be it. This is why the most important thing that Joe Biden did, and it's not sexy and it wasn't headlines, was to create a pause. He paused exports of liquefied natural gas, which is basically liquefied methane. He paused it. And the other, I know you all read about how he had all the CEOs of the oil companies to, to Mar-a-Lago. And he said, if you give me a billion, I'll kill all the air, you know, all of the regulations. I'll do away with the EPA. The one thing that those CEOs cared about was the pause. Lift the pause. This is why every, all the people who are really making this their life focus like I am, the focus is on the Gulf. If we can stop this, if we can stop the exports, they're going to stop drilling. It's not for us, it's all for exports. And when they export gas, our gas prices go up, big time. They don't tell us that. But if we can stop that, if we can re-elect Biden and make him make the pause permanent, so much will be solved. This is a huge thing and a very brave thing that, that Biden did. So conversely, let's talk about uh, you know, obviously, we have an important election coming up. Uh, Existential it's, election. It's I've never thought that before, ever. Donald you know, Trump. You've always been able to think, well, you know, in four more years, then we don't have four years to lose, folks. Let's talk this about what Donald Trump has said about climate change. He's called it a hoax. His first administration weakened or wiped out more than 125 environmental rules and pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement. If reelected, he's certain to do so again. And according to something called Project 2025, he will most likely gut the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which provides weather and climate forecasts and warnings. So talk about how you envision a future Trump presidency if he is, in fact, reelected, impacting climate change. What was that? <laughs> A little Jewish thing, never mind. Um, I will ask all of you to Google Project 25. I did that last week, and I, I read three chapters, and I started shaking. It is a blueprint for fascism. Do away with the EPA. Dig this. Do away with the Department of Education. <laughs> and dismantle the government. It's a 90-page document written by 400 conservatives, many of them through the Heritage Foundation, that is ready to go. It's very granular. So many parts of government and so many government workers, the ones that have been there for a long time and know how to make things work, would be done away with. Please read it. I don't care what party you belong to. You need to know what's being planned if the orange man gets elected. And it will affect all of us. And he also said, I read last night, he was in a, the Orange Man was in an event last night and said he'd slash a thousand times taxes on the wealthy. You know, and I know that there's some, I'm sure that there's some people in, in this tent that would get a lot richer if that happened. But I've known a lot of very, very rich people. I've slept with some of them. And I... <laughs> And I know that <laughs> when you really get down to it, and I know it for myself because, you know, I'm close to the end, it's not the money that will make you go out happy. It's being surrounded by love, people who love you, not who you bought, but people who love you, and 
feeling that you've made a difference for the good in your life, having meaning. We all want meaning in our lives. And we can't, we can't continue. You know, the world is so different from what I described back in the 30s. We, we, we can't afford right now to only care about money. Greed is not good. We can get rich, we, but we don't need to get so rich that we sacrifice everybody else, and especially human beings in other parts of the world. You know, women are the most impacted by the climate crisis for all kinds of reasons. The legacy of colonialism, the legacy of gender injustice, we're always left behind. Women are the ones in most of the world who grow the food, plant the crops, harvest the crops, cook the food, find the water, find the wood, and droughts and fires and floods make their lives so much harder. They're the last because they stay behind to take care of communities and the kids. They're the last to be rescued. And then on fat, women have more body fat than men, and the pesticides that are in the air now everywhere they live, they, they, harp, they take up residency in body fat. And that's why it's so dangerous, because we have it in our breast milk, we have it in the fetuses. It goes to the children when we, when we, when we feed. So we, we are the most impacted. We're also the ones that come up with the solutions for the most part. It started with Rachel Carson's. Historically, we've always been on the front of climate solutions. All over Africa, schoolgirls bringing solar heaters and light into their schools. Wangari Maathai with the Green Revolution in Kenya. It's women who are leading the way. That's why there were so many women. It moved me so much when I was for four and a half months in Washington getting arrested. All these gray-haired ladies kept coming around. It was Well, you wonderful. know, what was that experience like? You were arrested how many times, Jane, in I don't remember. But I think it was five. Look, I, we had many, many speakers of color at our rallies, and I noticed that they never engaged with our civil disobedience, and I know why. If you're a white movie star, they're going to treat you differently than if you're a black woman who nobody knows and they can do something and nobody knows about it. So that, you know, we were, it's not like it, it was down in the South at the lunch counters when they were engaging in civil disobedience, but we did. We, civil disobedience is great because, have, have, you, have any of you, when you watched a, you know, documentaries about really brave people, and they're getting beaten, or you know, dogs are attacking them, or they're they're risking their lives, and you wonder. I always do. Would I have been able to be that brave? This is our documentary moment. This is the moment where we can show our kids. We weren't just having manicures and massages and rearranging the china. We did everything we could. I want my children and grandchildren to know that. I can't remember what I started talking about. That's okay. <laughs> That's I've okay. lost my brain. <laughs> you, you were talking about women. You were talking about... Oh, yeah, women. Women. But, but we'll Jane, I women. wanted to ask you about RFK Jr. because he protested alongside you uh, for your fire drill Friday, right. Fridays in 2019. He was also arrested. What is your perspective on him and the campaign he's... Bobby has been a friend of my family's and me, and, you know, we really respected him as an environmentalist, but it doesn't really matter whether he... any of that. What matters is if you vote for a third-party candidate or you decide to sit it out, you are voting for the orange man, which means you're voting for fascism. <laughs> so appealing as Bobby may be, this is not the time, folks, to play around with somebody who's relying on, you know, his recent ancestors. You know, I mean, it's... We're the first generation that can do something, that have felt the effects of this, and we're the only generation left that can do something about it. So let's do something about it. We can still do something about it. It's not too late. And we can't do anything about it if we vote for Bobby Kennedy or Jill Stein or we decide to sit it out. It's too important. You have talked about... Um, Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Was it something I said? <laughs>
And you know what else? It's so disturbing. I was sitting in the audience and rows of people looking at their phone. <laughs> People can't put their phones down anymore. What is this? I don't. Th I think people are it, all watching you, Jane. Is it just because I'm old? Nobody's <laughs> looking at their phone right now. Um, you are such a force of nature, and you spend so much time doing this. I'm curious how you have educated yourself so much, and and how you would advise everyone in this room to educate themselves. Particularly, there is so much disinformation, so much contradictory information out in the, in the ether. You know, how would you recommend people, A, get involved and B, educate themselves, or probably the well, other for, way around? You know, you, you don't have to be an expert. I, I'm just kind of a nerd. And I want to be like Greta when I grow up, or when I shrink down, or whatever. But I, you don't have to know everything. But you do have to know that now is the time. This is the pivotal election, and this is the pivotal decade, what's left of it. This is what you have to know. Then, God, I mean, here in Aspen, everybody's thinking about climate. There's so many people you could talk to. There's books you can read. There's, um, I love how this stuff floats through. <laughs> <laughs> um, Those of us who can afford to buy electric vehicles should do so. That's what will make the cost go down. You know, when I started in the, in the 80s, early 80s, when I started the workout videos, the guy who, the only person that had ever done home videos was named Stuart Carl. They were home improvement videos. He asked me to do a video. I said, what's that? I didn't know anybody. That, that owned a VCR player. They were too expensive. And, and who would buy a VCR player when there was nothing that you really wanted to watch over and over? Then I made my video and suddenly, wealthy women first bought VCRs to do Jane and, and then the price dropped and everybody else got VCRs. And that's what we have to do with electric vehicles. And buy them and, and see there's a little slump right now. There was a big increase because wealthy people bought them, and now people are waiting for the price to drop, and all the, most of the automobile industries are working hard to make cars that are less expensive, and so they're buying, the hybrid market is up. It's a step before the others are more affordable, and there are more charging stations, but this is something you can do. Then you can stop using single-use plastics, obviously, and you can try to compost, and you, can, and you can grow your own food, and you can ride bikes, and you can stop flying in private pool. I couldn't believe flying into this airport. I haven't been here for decades. I, and there are like four times as many private planes as there used to be back in the good old days. Did you fly here commercial? Huh? Did you fly here commercial? Yeah, I only fly commercial, yeah. Right, and so, you know, just right now, the most important thing that every one of us can do is vote for climate and pay attention to down ballot races. Find out if the, cli if the person you're thinking of voting takes money from the fossil fuel industry, you can find that out. Elect people who care about you, care about, American people and nature and not beholden to corporations. Jane? How many people promise that they'll <laughs> vote with climate in their heart? Raise their hand. <laughs> yeah, wow, okay, good, thanks. <laughs> That's great, really do it. I was gonna ask you, we, on, we only have a, a minute and 30 seconds left, you know, Tomorrow night, there's going to be a very important debate uh, between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. A lot has been made of Joe Biden's age and his. I'm older than of, he is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the number. It's not the number. You know, first of all, a president sets sets the trends and everything. But the people who run the government are not the president. They're the, they're the, what do you call them? Cabinet. Cabinets. And the, and the, you know, those people. 
<laughs> um, what was the question? No, I was going to ask you about questions about Joe Biden's age. Oh, yeah. You've, you've, I, it doesn't I wanted matter. you to opine on matter. that criticism. I'm furious with Joe Biden. I am fear. He promised when he was running for president that he would do away with, that he would do everything to get rid of the, the, the things that we pay $20 billion a year, whatever they are, that he was going to do, for example. He hasn't lived up to everything, but he's been a historic climate president. He's done more than any other president has for climate. And it doesn't really matter. What matters is if Joe Biden is our next president, we have a voice. He provides us with a context in which we can fight and he can be pressured. He launched the pause that I talked about that stops exporting methane around the world because people from Cancer Alley, black people and Hispanic people went to DC and pressured and fought. So did a lot of big donors, by the way, too. It was a combination, but he can be pressured. You can't do that with fascism. We lose our ability to fight. You fight and you go to jail. So it doesn't matter that he's old. It doesn't matter that he stutters. None of that matters. What matters is he gives us the possibility of a future that we lose if the other guy wins. And whether you're a Republican or Democrat, keep that in your heart and your head. Jane Fonda, you still got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's walk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jane didn't really need me here at all, but I was happy to share the stage with her. This concludes our afternoon of conversation. Evenings at Ideas is now starting in the Marble Garden. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. And one more round of applause for Jane. Thank you.